guess you're not here for Julian Assange. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight, and it's a pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Neil Ferguson. As many of you know, Harry Truman once said, anything new in the world is history you haven't learned yet. And Professor Ferguson has been a testament to that. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Bernard Fulda, who's been kind enough to invite him on our behalf and kind enough to jointly sponsor this event. Dr. Fulda. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You may not be aware of, of it, but this is a record for the History Faculty's Public and Popular History Seminar. <laughs> uh, and this will be particularly delightful to Neil uh, when I tell him that last time David Starkey came to talk to us, we didn't have a third of the audience size. Um, in fact, this is the second time that Neil Ferguson has graced us with his presence. Five years ago, he came to introduce what was then his most recent book, his most recent project, The War of the World, also accompanied by a Channel 4 documentary series. Um, it is somewhat shocking to know that since then, this is the third book to have appeared in those five years. Over the last ten years, he has written, published a total of eight books. Now, some in this room may recognize a workaholic when they see one. Most of you probably recognize an alcoholic when you see one. Um, but it, this is not the reason why we are hosting Neil Ferguson tonight. If he was just an incredibly productive historian, believe it or not, we could have invited the one or other person. The reason he, he is here has something to do with Cambridge. It must be something in the air. Some 20 years ago when he arrived as a research fellow at Christ's, he allegedly uh, pronounced to a senior journalist in this country that he wanted to become the H.E.P. Taylor de nos jours, for those of you whose French is rather rusty, the H.E.P. Taylor of the current generation, i.e. the media don, the preeminent media don of the 1960s and 70s, uh, would find a rightful successor. That's, by the way, why he applied to Magdalen College, Oxford, only then to realize that he wasn't going to be taught by H.P. Taylor rather than by some medievalists who hated H.P. Taylor's guts. So um, um, he certainly had um, to, to work on getting there. And arguably, arguably, he's made it. Now some heretics in this room may feel that there are other contenders, uh, David Starkey, Simon Sharma, and fantastic history communicators as they may be, they don't actually quite have the range, and certainly not the impact that Neil Ferguson has had with his work. Now, as far as the audience tonight will go, Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people of 2004 is exactly that, a piece of um, journalistic attention-seeking in the year 2004. Perhaps the learned audience tonight will be more impressed by um, the tribute paid to Neil Ferguson's impact on British society through the pen of Alan Bennett and his personification of Irvin in the History Boys. Now, he actually got him quite wrong. But being the bad guy of one of the uh, most successful plays and a well, a reasonably successful, not very successful film, it's probably not bad. Uh, you know, uh, some decades from now when no one is going to talk about Time magazine, he'll still be in there. Um, the reason he's here tonight is that he is not just a fantastic history communicator, but also a man interested in current affairs, in politics, in finance. He attracts the ire and indeed quite often the venom of contemporaries who feel that he's seriously getting things wrong, like Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman, who thinks that Neil Ferguson's recipe uh, for financial salvation is a road to uh, uh, utter destruction. Um, and now he's trying to sort out history as it's taught in schools. This is what we tried to get him to talk about uh, when we invited him. And rather than just being very negative and telling 
what was wrong with the way that, uh, that history teachers uh, kind of violated history, he set out to produce a book. And um, so this is it, Civilization, the West and the Rest, Neil Ferguson's take on the Great Divergence, why the West became the preeminent place in the second half of the second millennium. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Neil Ferguson. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Bernard. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, when I heard that uh, Julian Assange was going to precede me, I, I did call into question the choice of warm-up act. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I really couldn't complain. Historians ultimately are the beneficiaries of leaks of all kinds. If it weren't for the great process of official leakage which declassifies documents, it would be very hard indeed to do what I'm trying to do at the moment and write a life of Henry Kissinger. I would just say that it is extraordinarily difficult uh, to conduct diplomacy without some kind of confidentiality, some element of secrecy. Uh, and it was for that reason that I was one of those who deplored uh, the WikiLeaks decision, essentially to put the State Department out of business. But that's not what I want to talk about this evening. I, while well, some of you may have been listening to Mr. Assange, was having afternoon tea with the Steiners. George and, and Zara Steiner are old friends of mine. And in many ways, they exemplify what is wonderful about this university. For two hours we talked about such an astonishing range of historical subjects. Everything from the events that led up to George Steiner's father leaving France before, just before the German invasion to the finer points of a recently uh, published book on the Holocaust to Zara's forthcoming second volume of her massive history of interwar diplomacy. It was magical. I walked there from Sydney, Sussex. The cherry blossom was out on the tree just in front of the rooms I used to have in Peterhouse. I have to tell you I felt an overpowering nostalgia. I regret actually that I ever left this place. It's the most beautiful university in the world. You are so, so lucky to be here. And in addition to being beautiful, it is still one of the greatest universities in the world. And in particular, it has one of the greatest history departments in the world. It must be great because so many of my former students at Oxford are now employed here. <laughs> or at least two here tonight, in addition to my excellent successor at Peterhouse. If you are here at Cambridge reading history, by definition, you must have been taught history pretty well at school. Otherwise, it seems unlikely that you would have got in. And so you may be feeling that I'm here to talk about a non-problem. What could possibly be wrong with the way that history is taught in British schools? Well, let me try to convince you that there is a massive problem, but also to try and uh, suggest that there is a solution to that problem. There are a few rather shocking statistics I want to begin with, and forgive me if I refer to my notes here. Right now, in England, 25% of all schools and 40% of academies no longer teach history as a discrete subject, even in year seven. 30% of comprehensives and 40% of academies devote 
less than an hour a week on average to the teaching of history. 5% of schools are shifting to a new two-year key stage three which will allow people to drop history at the age of 13. Only 4% of GCSEs taken last year were in history. That is down from 8% uh, in my day. More people took design and technology than history at GCSE last year. It's about 6% of all A-levels compared with nearly 9% uh, in my day. More people took psychology last year. History is probably less studied by English teenagers than by teenagers in any other country in the developed world. And that is one of the reasons that I started to think seriously about why university teachers like me had essentially been asleep at the wheel of tertiary education while our subject died at the secondary level. And I don't think that dying is putting it too strongly. How did I first notice it? It was partly doing Oxford admissions. It was partly talking to my own three children as they went up through the English system. What struck me as I observed uh, them growing up was the absence from their education of any interconnected narrative about the past. What they did at school was a kind of smorgasbord of subjects which were presented in no particular order and which were sometimes taught more than once. They would do the rise of Hitler at least twice, in one case three times. Henry VIII, yes, but never Henry VII, Henry VI, Henry V, or any of the other Henrys. Martin Luther King Jr. popped up, but never Martin Luther. It was the moment that I asked them all who Martin Luther was, and not one of them knew, that I realized we really had a problem. And I started to wonder just how serious the problem was. Whether it was just them. Whether Jesus was just getting unlucky in the people who applied. And so I started to do some research. And it turned out that they were far from unrepresentative of uh, the kids going through secondary education uh, in England over the last 10 or so years. A huge proportion of people who do GCSE uh, in this country do the Nazis. Often they've done the Nazis before, which is of course why they do the Nazis. And that skewing of study means that while they may know a good deal about Adolf Hitler's rise, they cannot put the following events in the right order nor describe what these events signify. The Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. Can you? If I put one of you in the spot now and said, first, did I do them in the right order? Second, what did each one signify? Could you do it? Of course, this is Cambridge. <laughs> but you know what? The average school leaver in this country could not. I would be surprised if 1% of school leavers this year could do it. Let me tell you about first year undergraduates at another university not a bad university. I wouldn't name it, but by no means a bad university. In fact, a Russell Group University, I think. These were undergraduates who had been admitted to read history. 34%, a 
III knew who was monarch at the time of the Spanish Armada. 31% knew the location of the Boer War. 16% knew who commanded British forces at Waterloo. A third thought it was Nelson. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't think it was Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I, was, I literally was in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> I was going through Trafalgar Square in a taxi with someone. And, and she said, what's that? I said, what do you mean, what's that? What's that big pole there? <laughs> I said, it's Nelson's column. She said, Nelson Mandela? <laughs> That's a true story. So, this is a really good one. 11% of Harvard, of, I nearly said which university it was to stop myself. <laughs> I don't want to give it away, you know. I don't want to embarrass anybody by saying which university it was. 11% uh, were able to name a single 19th century British Prime Minister. And other surveys reveal the same terrifying levels of ignorance. Now, I don't want to claim that the English are uniquely ignorant. In fact, Newsweek, for which I'm currently writing, are about to publish... Uh, a great survey on American ignorance which shows that about a third of US citizens, born US citizens, would fail the citizenship test uh, and in particular would fail the history section. So it's not that the English are uniquely ignorant. But there is a problem that I want to suggest to you exists in the way that we teach history in secondary schools. And in my view this problem perfectly illustrates the law of unintended consequences, which is the most powerful law, perhaps the only law, of history. It was in the 1970s and in the 1980s that a group of educationists began to propagandize what they called the new history. This was to be contrasted with the old history, which consisted of one effing thing, if you'll forgive me, paraphrasing Alan Bennett, after another. One effing thing after another was boring, it was chronological, and that had to go. In place of one effing thing after another, children were going to be taught skills. You don't need knowledge if you've got skills. So skills became the centerpiece of the new historical education. Instead of teaching people content, there was going to be an emphasis on discovery. No pedagogy, no authority figure telling people what happened. The kids were going to find out for themselves in a process of child-centered discovery. And above all, instead of writing essays, they were going to engage in source analysis with occasional bouts of empathy. Imagine you are a Roman centurion. Now, I've no doubt that those people who were responsible for the uh, changes in the way that history was taught were well-meaning and sincere people. But the combination of their influence in education, so one of them leaving now is an educationist, fleeing. The combination of the educationalists thinking about how history should be changed and a conservative government that thought the national curriculum should be created in order to prevent dangerous lefties from teaching that Lenin was a good man, this combination was fatal. An extraordinary bureaucratic process produced a highly complex national curriculum, comprehensive in, in terms of the methods that were to be taught and the subjects that were to be covered. The Regis Professor at this university praises this national curriculum in a recent issue of the London Review of Books. The problem is that what is there in the national curriculum bears almost no relation to what happens in the typical English classroom. 
because rather than teach all the many wonderful things set out in the national curriculum, most schools teach a tiny selection of these things in no particular order with relatively little attention to the long run. Let me give you an illustration of the kind of thing that ultimately happens. I want to make it clear that I do not blame teachers for this. In fact, I think teachers have been the victims of the law of unintended consequences. I blame far more the tyranny of examination boards as well as the tyranny uh, of the educationalists in the system. In the end, the culmination of much historical study in this country is a GCSE. And I want to give you an example of what the GCSE is now like. Some of you probably did it quite recently. History, you're here at Cambridge reading it, is exciting. The origins of the First World War are especially exciting. Indeed, I can think of a few subjects that could consistently keep me awake during an Oxford tutorial uh, more successfully than the origins of the First World War. But the way that history is taught in English schools somehow makes it boring. <laughs> Question 8. The road to war in Europe, 1870-1914. This question is about the growth of international rivalry. Look at the boxes below. Write down the two ways that German foreign policy changed after the resignation of Bismarck. Occupation of colonies, development of the navy, construction of railways, opening of the Kiel Canal. Part B. That was for two marks, incidentally. Choose one of your answers to question A and describe one effect that it had on German policy. Three marks. C. Give two reasons why the first Morocco crisis developed in 1905. Four marks. D. Choose any two of the following and explain the part that they played in the second Morocco crisis in 1911. I'll spare you the four. And here's the piece de resistance. The source question. Yes, the source question. That's what you've all been waiting for. Eight marks. Now, what is it going to be? Which of the many diplomatic dispatches will it be that the candidate has to analyse and interpret? Oh. Source from a modern textbook. <laughs> Come on. An astonishing five lines of text follow. The Archduke arrived at Sarajevo by train and was met at the station by the governor of Bosnia. He was then driven out of the station in an open-topped car to the town hall for an official welcome. As the Archduke's car came down a Pelki toward the town hall, Nedjelko Kabranovic stepped forward and threw his bomb. He missed and it exploded behind the Archduke's car. in clear violation of health and safety directives. <laughs> Use the source to describe the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> that, sorry bro. <laughs> That's it. That is how you make the origins of the First World War staggeringly boring. And also it's how you automate the examination process. And it's how you kill all interest in the subject in a young mind. I want to really have a discussion with you. So let me briefly tell you what I think we need to do. Because it's actually not that hard. Obviously we need teenagers in this country to study more history than they do. It can't be right that even people admitted to read history at a major British university do not know where the Boer War happened. So there need to be more hours and more years of history study. Ideally, we scrap the premature specialisation that characterises English education and we make people do an international type baccalaureate in which history is a core subject. I'd prefer it to be core rather than one of two. Currently the idea I think is that it can be history or geography. But of course geography is not a serious subject which is why it's not. 
I just had to try that to see how many geographers there were in the room. But I suspect that there will be, uh, there will be, there will be options. Um, they need to be taught, the next generation, the broad outlines of British history and the broad outlines of world history. It's not impossible. To those who say, oh, we don't have time. We just have time for Hitler and Henry VIII and maybe Martin Luther King Jr. To them I say, come off it. It's perfectly plausible to do the entire history of the world in a single volume. Who here has read Ernest Gombrich's Little History of the World? Good. It's a fantastic book. You should all read it. In a single volume, which he dashed off in the 1930s as a graduate, Ernest Gombrich, the great art historian, tells the history of the world in language that anyone can understand. So the idea that we can't do this is absurd. Of course we can. That's the second thing we need to do. The third thing we need to do is to ask some interesting questions. Here I differ from my good friend Simon Sharma. It's not just about telling stories. History is not just about narratives. It is about problems. It is about questions. What the Germans call the Fragestellung, how you pose the question, is crucial. Right now, British teenagers are asked stunningly boring questions, as I just demonstrated to you. They need to be asked interesting questions. To me, the most interesting question of the last 500 or 600 years is why on earth did a few Western countries rise to such a position of predominance relative to the rest of the world? You would never have predicted that in the year 1411, but it happened. And that is the central question that I address in my new book and in the new television series. Because it just seems like a really interesting question. In fact, I can't think of a more interesting question. And it's also kind of hard to answer. There's no one simple explanation. But it has to be an important question. And I think it's an important question because, like the great philosopher of history, Collingwood, I think we need to ask questions that illuminate the present. Why would I be interested in this question now? Because it's clear that we're coming to the end of the age of Western predominance. In our time, on our watch, that incredible great divergence that began in around 1500 and carried on to the 1970s is coming to an end incredibly fast. So what better time to engage the interest of the people you are teaching to ask the question, why did it happen in the first place? How come in 1978, the average American was at least 20 times richer than the average Chinese. Or, if you just do it in current dollar terms, 70 times richer. Why was life expectancy in the West more than double what it was in most of the rest of the world? As recently as the 1970s. Indeed, in some parts of the world, it's still a huge differential. So I think interesting questions would really help. And to me, that's one of them. Two more things we need to do. Liberate the English from the tyranny of examinations. Why do we put so much emphasis on these externally marked, robotically marked examinations that reduce the study of the past to questions like the ones I just read to you? When I teach a course at Harvard, only a small proportion of the final grade is based on an exam. Because guess what? Exams are not a particularly brilliant way of seeing how people are learning. And it would empower teachers and schools more than anything I can think of to reduce the importance that we attach to these frankly increasingly worthless qualifications at GCSE and AS and A level. Get the assessment back in the classroom, empower the teachers and reduce the prescriptive elements of the national curriculum. Let's keep it really simple. You just need to leave school knowing roughly the order in which the following things happened and what they were. The Renaissance, the Reformation, you get the general idea. It's simple, really. One final thing. Could we please have better teaching materials in schools? Have you seen the kind of textbooks, the worksheets? They're dire. They're so awful. But you know what? Thank you. I'm glad someone agrees with me. It's partly our fault. It's partly the fault of the university academics. We just didn't 
do it. We just left it to other people. Write a textbook for a secondary school? Oh, I'm working on a review article for past and present. <laughs> Far more important. The British uh, academics have a lot to answer for because they basically left the field open. And we need to engage. We need to publish textbooks. We need to have good course materials that make history exciting to read about and watch on a screen because people are going to watch it on a screen. And that's what has to change. If we do, if we do this right, then it just might be that history becomes as exciting for the majority of people in British schools rather than just for a tiny minority of lucky students, people like you, who are brilliantly taught, who are highly motivated, who do get good teaching materials, and who ultimately do get to come to this fantastic university. Thanks very much indeed. Just ask that you state your name, your college, and please uh, just state your question and be as concise as possible. So we're going to start on the left and move to the right. Yes. It's really quite simple. If you don't understand where something came from, it's quite hard to understand it at all. Now, at the risk of sounding too instrumental or functional in my approach, I really think that to be an effective citizen, a responsible adult, you need to know where things came from. Otherwise, what's the rationale? When you drive past the Houses of Parliament, do you really understand what they're for? One of the things that most strikes me at the moment is the degree of complacency we have about our own extraordinary institutions in this country. We take them for granted because we don't know where they came from. When I was working on The Ascent of Money, which is a book about the financial crisis, indeed it's a book about financial history, my primary motivation was this. All around in the city of London and on Wall Street in 2006-07, I saw people who knew no financial history running banks. I used to ask, I still do it, groups of this size in the financial world, who here has read Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, the single most important book of American financial history. And in a room this size, typically three hands would go up. And this would be senior executives in financial institutions. Their ignorance of financial history was one of the main reasons the financial crisis happened. They're all wandering around saying, oh, a seven standard deviation event is a one in five billion probability. It, well, it, hap it happens once in the history of the entire universe. We can relax. And then, of course, it happened. Because, in fact, they happen pretty often. So, I think that illustrates the dangers of historical ignorance. And I don't think historical ignorance is only dangerous in the financial world. I think it's dangerous in the political world. Let me give you another example. One reason that Barack Obama has opposed, up until this point, the imposition of a no-fly zone in Libya to prevent Muammar Gaddafi slaughtering his own people is that he believes, and I quote, that the best revolutions are organic. I spent a little time trying to work out what that meant. It's like an organic revolution. Is it more expensive? <laughs> Do you have any organic revolutions? <laughs> to go with my arugula. <laughs> what he meant, of course, translated into, uh, into English, was he meant that the, 
that's revolutions are not aided by external forces. This is the President of the United States of America. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you do the history of the American War of Independence, <laughs> but if you haven't done it, check out the Battle of Yorktown. Those ships you see over there offshore, they seem to be French. <laughs> With an American citizen here on my left, can you confirm that you had some help? De Grasse, Admiral De Grasse. I don't think you had an organic revolution. Absolutely not. I think it I think it's full of full of additives. <laughs> We have, we have people in positions of extraordinary power who appear to be basically ignorant of history. That's the thing that scares me. For the ordinary voter, the stakes may be lower. Yeah, they're definitely lower than for the President of the United States, but it's still important. You still need to know why a racist argument is a dangerous argument. And I think history is about the best way of understanding why it's dangerous. So that's my reason. I don't think we can be effective citizens if we don't know history. I think it's as important as that. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to go around. One, two, and three. I also do short answers. Yeah. <laughs> one, uh, one, two, three, four, please, go ahead. and one that I, I take really seriously. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. Indeed, I think the best way of making a general point stick is to tell a human story. If you ever have time, and I'm, you're probably preparing lesson plans and all the rest of it, but if you ever have time to watch any of the TV films that I do, You'll see that's what we do. I mean, the reason that I make these films is that you can't actually reach a million people with a book. Not a history book, but you can reach an audience of more than a million with a series like Civilization. And I'll tell you a story about that, which I, I was telling a, a journalist from Varsity this evening, but it bears telling. The combination of a big argument and the human story is a really potent one. And I don't think that it's impossible to do, as we've done in this series, 600 years of history covering the whole world uh, in less than six hours. And yet, we've still, without losing that kind of human detail, if it, if it had just been broad brush stuff about the scientific revolution, the audience would have been 100, not a million. So the key, I think, is to try to combine the two. It's not, it seems to me, impossible to tell the story of, let's say, the origins of the First World War in such a way that you, you emphasize all the big, broad forces at work, and at the same time you tell them the story about Gavrilo Princip and an act of what could be called state-sponsored terrorism. It also helps to bring it up to date in that way. One thing that works really well, and I'm spending a lot of time on, is using games to engage the kind of students you teach. Uh, especially uh, that generation uh, which has grown up with video games. 
they learn a lot when they get a chance to, to use serious strategic games to understand problems like 1914 or 1940. But let me tell you the story. Just two days ago, a student at the London School of Economics came up to me and said, oh, I just want to thank you. And I, I didn't remember lending anybody any money that week, so I was a little uneasy. And he said, no, no, I want to thank you because you actually got me here. So I thought, I don't remember that either. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to be a paternity suit next. And he said, no, I want to thank you because I was failing at school. He was the son of a single parent who was working at Heathrow Airport. He was about to be excluded from school for disciplinary offences. He said, and then I saw one of your Empire films. And I thought that was quite interesting. And I went and had a look at some more of it. And then I got the book. And I thought, actually, maybe this could be something worth doing. And from that point on, he said, I studied, and I ended up getting to LSE. Television is a very powerful way of teaching history, precisely because it combines the big argument with the detail. This is not a commercial. It's a sincere point. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. But you have to be selective. Thelonious Monk. Who has heard of Thelonious Monk here? Right. So the great jazz pianist famously says, in jazz, it's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. And the real challenge for a historian is what to leave out. When you look at anything that I've written, stuff gets left out. It's on the cutting room floor, it doesn't make it. Strategic omission is the, is the thing you have to master. Deciding which particular story, which individual you're going to zoom in on that the students can relate to. Here's a good tip. Most history is made by people closer in age to you than me. Since for most of history, life expectancy at birth in most places is from the late 20s into the early 30s. A few old guys get to live, but actually most people die pretty young. And that means that a lot of the action is, is by young people. Henry V was, what, 10 years younger than me when he died. So one of the big advantages you have in the classroom is that you are actually talking to the age group that makes history. And I'm emphasizing that, that youthful component in the historical process is a huge technique. Most textbooks are full of guys with beards, white beards. I mean, you just flick through the typical textbook, it's just a whole bunch of old geezers. Whereas what we want to see are the boy soldiers. That's the way, I think, to engage the interest. Princip is, is a great subject for study. And he's the kind of person I'd zoom in on if I were you. Thanks. Okay, uh, you're the second. Uh, you're, the, you're the third. And then we're going to shift over. And does anyone want to ask a professor for the same question? <coughs> Why don't we take three questions to shut me up for a bit? And then I'll do three in a row. Yeah, I mean, you just pointed me earlier. 
I'm going to keep out of this. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. What, what's your third point? I just want to put it to you that your vision is flawed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, do, do, do go on. It's um, a question, I yeah. think, actually. Uh, no. I think it's do, I, do I know that my vision is flawed? Well, no, I think it's flawed, firstly, because you say that it's very important that we have history taught as an interconnected narrative. I agree with you. <laughs> but you also say that it's boring to specialise, that we shouldn't specialise, that we're somehow uh, throwing people in at the deep end too early. I disagree. I think that you have to teach history as an, as an interconnected narrative. And I think that it is a great problem that earlier on, during uh, the, the years in which people are in education, they're not taught history in that way. But at GCSE, at A level, you have to have that specialism, I think. Um, and then the second point you were, you were making, I think, is that the resources poured into education in this country have not been great enough. I and mean, certainly we're going to see now cuts. To the, to the education budget, so I don't think that's a fair point. And if you look at spending pre-1997, I think you'll find that it's considerably uh, smaller in quantity than that that, uh, that, that succeeded the late victory. Is that the end of the question? Yeah. <laughs> Let me take these questions and then we'll switch over to the, uh, the other side of the chamber. The MBA um, as a qualification is, is something that I like. Uh, I found teaching not only at Harvard Business School but at, at NYU Stern very rewarding. And one of the reasons that I started to do it was to go back to my earlier point. I really think that people who are going to run corporations or work for corporations or start businesses benefit from his, historical knowledge. And, and I think one of the strengths of the Harvard uh, model is that we essentially using the case method teach a lot of history. We, we may not call it that. But every time you take a case study, whether it's General Electric or Enron, you're, you're basically doing a little bit of business history. Other business schools, I don't know about Judge, but other business schools, uh, Wharton for example, or Stanford, are far more theoretical in their approach. And I think they have, for that reason, contributed rather more than HBS did to the excessively model-driven view of business that I think was a part of the cause of the crisis. So I urge all business schools to have a history component to the course and to get some, to get some historians, especially some economic historians in. It would be great to see that happen here. Um, the question about social elements in history is a really, is a really good one. I, I, I think that one of the, the challenges of teaching history is that at some level it's wrong to say the past is another country. At some level it's actually more different than that. <laughs> it's another planet. Because to live in a world in which life expectancy is in the late 20s or early 30s, to live in a world of such great uncertainty even about your life expectancy is profoundly different from our modern condition. So there's a sense in which we are right, and your teachers were right, to emphasize the yawning gap between our lives and the lives of the people we study. But there are also these extraordinary, enduring predicaments that are central to the human condition that make Shakespeare intelligible to us today. I begin civilization very early in the book by just quoting from my favorite poet, John Donne. It's a poem about bereavement. And I want to make the point that for Dunn's generation, indeed for most generations until really the early 20th century, bereavement, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, that was the norm. We are this strange late human form where bereavement comes to people in their 90s. And it is profoundly different. And yet, loss is loss. And the emotions that Dunn articulates, we can understand and empathize with. I, I mocked earlier empathy because of the way in which it has been, it's become a cartoon version. Um, there's a cartoon version of empathy in, in, in some secondary school teaching. But of course, empathy is central to what we do as historians. Collingwood rightly said that what we do when we study the past is we use relics of it, documents, bits and pieces, and we try to reconstruct past thought. 
And doing that involves reenacting it and reliving it in our minds, in our imaginations. That, I think, is at the center of what historians do. It's why it's not social science. Uh, it's actually an enormous leap of the imagination. And I don't want to denigrate that. So that's the challenge. We are profoundly differently situated from most people who ever lived. The dead outnumber us substantially. Maybe 7% of all the human beings who ever lived are alive now. The dead are the majority. And their lives were very, 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 very different from ours. But we're humans. Evolution has not changed us. And therefore, we can identify them even though their predicaments were so different. The gentleman who says my vision is flawed, I think attempted to politicize this discussion in, a, in an unhelpful way. But this is, after all, the union. Uh, and so let me rise to that particular challenge. You said two things. Uh, first, you misquoted me. I don't think I ever said it was boring to specialize. Uh, I just said that the way in which we teach history has made things boring. And I think the exam paper I quoted from illustrates that. We must, of course, specialize at some stage. But you can't specialize until you have some sense of the order in which the great phenomena of the past occurred. And premature specialization is a major problem in our educational system today. Your neighbor just two seats along had that disorientating experience that my kids have had. The Aztecs, Henry VIII, Hitler. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like some kind of drug trip that we put our kids on. Whoa, man, Aztecs, Henry VIII, Hitler. In no particular order. So I think the specialization comes, can only come when you have mastered the broad outline. Otherwise, it's too soon. As for cuts in the education budget, well, there are two points I would make there. The first is that it is inconceivable that a government would be engaging in the kind of cuts in public expenditure this government is engaging in, were it not for grotesque mismanagement of public finances by its predecessor. And I'm afraid to say, <laughs> that, is, that is the reality uh, that is going to be extremely hard, not only for Britain to deal with, but for a whole list of countries in the world to deal with uh, in the months and years ahead. But there's good news, and this is my second point. Because of the way in which communications, and particularly publishing, are being transformed uh, by electronics, the cost of a unit of educational material is falling incredibly fast. The days that you had to carry around an enormous and rather expensive book when you were studying a subject at school belong in the past already. It still exists to some degree in the United States. Did you have one of those huge textbooks in US history that you had to kind of carry with both hands? I mean, I still see students who can hardly stand up going with their rucksacks to school. That's all going to be gone really soon. And we are going to have a new generation of educational materials which will be delivered uh, to budget iPads. And these, these educational materials are a fantastic opportunity for us historians and for people who work in any field to produce exciting course materials that are interactive, uh, that are not just slabs of text, the kind of things that would put your students off, but actually visual that are interactive, that have a, a simulation element. So it's actually a really exciting time in which it will be possible for schools to do a lot more with less money. Should we go to the right-hand side of the... Please do. Okay. In order to prevent further confusion, I'm going to go gray shirt, checkered shirt, tall guy, black shirt, uh, guy with the... Not all, not all guys, please. Yes, ladies, ladies, please. Lady over there, and the lady right here in the gray. So please start in the order that I do. Um, Chris Richards, Emmanuel. Um, for my sins, I did do uh, GCC and a level history. However, subsequent to that, I realized that the uh, one true faith was, in fact, geography. <laughs> Individual research.
research project. And there was, um, I struggle to remember what exactly I did. I, <laughs> it was that interesting. Um, I, I, no, I, in fact, it was, on, it was on the invasion of Britain um, by the Nazis. <laughs> if it had. And I remember that just being so much more interesting than being sort of spoon fed um, the very sort of acts of the 19th century poll. Do you think that um, we should drastically, uh, well, do you think that uh, you agree with me, that we should drastically increase the uh, scope of individual research in uh, GCA and a -level Did you do that today, though? Yeah. Thanks for all those. I'll try to do them in, in order. Uh, well, obviously the study of things that didn't happen is something that I've long been an advocate of. Perhaps you even read virtual history when you were uh, writing your, your individual study on the, the, the German non-invasion of, of Britain in 1940 because it's one of the chapters in, in virtual history. But that is the kind of thing that you can only do once you've got uh, some mastery of the basics uh, of what did happen. Uh, and so one has to be very careful about introducing the counterfactual, the what if, too early to people studying history. Particularly because there are very important rules about counterfactuals that aren't always ob obeyed. Of which the most important is we should not study alternatives that contemporaries did not consider themselves. If we don't confine ourselves in that way uh, if we start to imagine scenarios that nobody at the time thought of, we stop doing history, become something else. Uh, but because we are studying alternatives that in 1940 the Germans genuinely considered, and indeed the British worried about, then it's still within the realm of history. Am I in favour of that kind of individual study? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that in a way leads on to this question of how do we assess. 
The days of the standardized uh, exam are often looked back on very nostalgically, especially by the people who benefited from that particular mode of assessment, i.e. everybody in this room. It is not actually the only way in which a performance can be assessed. It's one important way, but it shouldn't be the sole way. And I think what your example illustrates, the, the role that can be played by individual studies uh, in A-level and indeed in other, at other stages is important. Because those can't really meaningfully be assessed uh, by a central uh, examining bureaucracy, nor should they. Nor should we exaggerate the quality of this impersonal grade producing machine. If we could see the people who graded our GCSEs and our A-levels, if we could see them, meet them, or watch them grading, the mystique would vanish like that. You've got to picture somebody sitting with a great pile of scripts and a cup of tea, probably the fourth cup of tea, wearily sighing, ticking boxes, and periodically mismarking a script. Typically what happens in our system now is that really good people do badly. They do badly because they don't actually match the marks grid that the examiners are working with. And so although it can seem wonderful to get an A and get into Cambridge, yeah, I love the system. This is called the bias of uh, success. Nobody in this room was on the wrong end of that system. And of course, most people end up on the wrong end of that system. We are a tiny, tiny, A-awarded minority. Now, delegating assessment to teachers sounds risky. Oh no, some crazed uh, history master in Rutland is going to be dishing out 100% to the students that he has a crush on. <laughs> That's presumably the problem that one worries about. But here's another interesting way in which technology changes that. Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at recently is uh, using integrated assessment uh, software so that you have a, a course platform that delivers not only the content uh, but it also uh, in fact facilitates assessment. So an exercise is assigned uh, through the platform and it has to be done by the students and then the assessment uh, is carried out. That means the assessment can itself be assessed. So there are ways in which Previously it was very difficult, now it is possible. We can, use, using spot checks, make sure that teachers who are doing continuous assessment are doing it fairly. So again, I think technology addresses this problem and makes it possible for what I do, uh, and, and most people do at Harvard, to become the general rule. Where there's an exam component, there's something that is done as an extended piece of work, there are things that are done in the classroom. You, must, you know, people should be graded in how they perform in class. There's a discipline problem, I gather, in some English schools. Jamie Oliver and David Starkey have been finding out all about it on TV. <laughs> you know, if course performance, if class performance is part of the grade, watch the behavior improve. It's 50% of the grade at Harvard Business School. I don't have any disciplinary issues, funnily enough, in my classroom. Historians in time of war. Well, in many ways, historians uh, have mostly operated in time of war, since if one looks at the great sweep of history, there's a lot of war going on. And historians are more or less close to it, depending on accidents of fate. I recently read a biography of Hugh Trevor Roper, which I highly recommend, by Adam Sisman, a great uh, Oxonian historian who, whose, uh, whose dual misfortune in late life was to authenticate the Hitler diaries and become master of Peterhouse. Uh, I'm not sure which of those was the greater misfortune. They, they, they scarred him both uh, pretty uh, deeply. Uh, if you read Trevor Roper's uh, life, you realize that his experience of World War II was the defining experience of his life. And, and this goes to the question about sources and methods, 
it was Trevor Roper's already honed ability to read documents, interpret them, and construct a historical narrative that enabled him to write the classic last days of Hitler, the definitive account of the final uh, days of the, of the Third Reich. So yeah, of course, historical methods are crucial. They're part of what we teach at school, and they're an important part of what we should teach at university. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that only history can teach those things. And nor should we kid ourselves that historians always do it well. A final thought on which to conclude, because we've massively overrun and you're probably dying to get to the bar. The big hole in the way that history is taught in most universities today, to say nothing of secondary schools, is the philosophy of history. I'm constantly shocked by how little that is offered to students even at the best institutions. And how, as a result, people think they have a grasp of historical methods, but in fact don't. Have only the haziest understanding of what it is that we really do as historians. So if you do nothing else after this evening, don't, don't rush out and buy my books. Actually do. <laughs> but before you do that, think about reading some of the great works of the philosophy of history which it seems to me have been for too long absent uh, from what people read as undergraduates. And that, after all, is what you're doing here. You've been very patient, audience. I've I tried to answer your questions. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. that um, on your way out there are some people collecting for the Japanese Red Cross Fund. The money will go directly to help victims of um, recent events in Japan. So if you do have anything that you could just pop in their buckets on the way out, that would be great. Sorry to still have it. Thank you. Uh,